So, I bought a boat. And a house. Uh, this channel is mainly about my boat, though, and the myriad of projects, big and small, required to save and improve her. So, welcome to Saving Ophelia. As you likely surmise from the channel's name, the thumbnail, and well, the intro, this video and the channel itself is centered around my boat Ophelia. In this first episode, I'll go over the boat itself, what her condition is, what I know about her story, and well, in general, what the hubbub is about. So, let's get started. Ophelia isn't a new boat, not by any stretch of the imagination. She was built in 1952-53. I don't know the exact build year because well, her paperwork can't quite seem to make up its mind and mentions both years. What I do know, though, is that she was designed and built by Paul Böhling at his shipyard in Hamburg in Germany, along with her two sisters, the Enchila and the Safari. These three boats were quite revolutionary when they were built. Until then, a boat would be designed on paper and then built, and you didn't know anything about the sailing characteristics until the boat actually hit the water. In this case, though, the boat was designed on paper, then a scale model was built and extensively tested in a towing channel before the design was committed to steel. This hadn't been done for a small private racing yacht before, only for big commercial ships, so this was a new thing. And this new thing seems to have paid off. During those first three years after being built, the oldest sister, the Inshalla, apparently won 40 races. Now, that's quite an impressive record if you ask me. At any rate, being a racing yacht, Ophelia is quite slim. She's got a beam that's a maximum width of 3.6 meters, around 12 feet, in relation to a length of 14 meters, just shy of 46 feet, and a draft of 2.4 meters. She's got a steel hull, so she's a bit to the heavy side with a displacement of around 18 metric tons. She's got a modified full keel and two wooden masts in a catch configuration. And she is not exactly in her best shape anymore. She doesn't look quite like the picture I showed you earlier. Currently she looks more like, well, this. Now, I know Ophelia doesn't exactly look too pretty at the moment, but she used to be fast, she's got nice lines, and she's got an interesting background. So, if in any way possible for me, I'll bring her back to life. One story from that interesting background is about Ophelia's creation. The story goes that she was built by a welding crew that used to build submarines at the nearby Beaumont Fuss shipyards during the Second World War. That shipyard also built the battleship Bismarck, so the welders definitely knew what they were doing. She might even be built from leftover stock from the submarine production, but I don't really know if there's any truth to that story, but it's a cool story nonetheless. Ophelia wasn't always called Ophelia. She was built at Stintfang, named after a hill near Hamburg that used to be part of the city's fortifications. Stintfang or Stintfang sailed races around Europe for a while, and Beckingham of Cows, yeah, I'm probably butchering that name completely, have some photos of her in the archives. While these photos are quite interesting, the price of Beckin are a bit too rich for me, so I haven't forked over the money for a good quality copy yet and have to settle for these photocopies. Well, I haven't forked over the money yet, that is. At some point, Stintfang was renamed Scott Free and moved to the Mediterranean Sea, likely to Cyprus. Scott Free sailed races around the Med, and there are still a few plaques with that name mounted in the boat today. Also, an article from a German sailing magazine mentions that she was owned by a Cypriot captain. However, it seems that there may be some truth to the superstition about changing a boat's name, because the article in the magazine isn't really about Ophelia or Scott Free, it's about an incident that she was caught up in. In 69, after apparently a name change, she was lying in Turklimano Harbour near Piraeus by Athens, and she was caught up in a fire. It started as a gas explosion on a neighboring yacht and then spread. Most of the ships were pulled to safety, but it was too late for Ophelia, she was known by this point. And 
when the fire was done, there was nothing wooden left on the boat and the engine room was flooded. So she was basically a wreck at this point. Only the steel hull survived unharmed, but this must have been enough as Ophelia was obviously deemed worthy of a rebuild. And this makes sense though, because the fully welded hull must have been quite expensive at the time. So she was rebuilt and reflagged around the same time. I don't know which came first because the paperwork doesn't say. Then in 1979, she was reflagged again, this time to Copenhagen in Denmark. And then she sailed Danish waters for a time. Then in 1992, she had the last major refit that we know of. The previous owner, the guy I bought Ophelia from, bought her eight or nine years ago with the intention of restoring her. So she must have been in a less than optimal condition already then. Unfortunately, he didn't get much further than the electrics and restoring the engine, or starting to restore the engine, before his job took him to Greenland. Not exactly a part of Denmark known for its yachting culture and facilities. So for the last, well, many years, she's just been lying in the harbor in Copenhagen, collecting rust, mussels, and, well, lots of rust. Most of Ophelia's paperwork has been waterlogged at some point, so what I've been able to rescue is incomplete. There are quite a few holes in the story of Ophelia still. Now, what I do know I've gathered from the remaining paperwork, from the previous owner, and a few factual bits were gathered with the help of a friendly German historian with an interest in boats, so a lot of thanks goes to Dagmar Rasmussen. Now, this is a caveat. And while we are in the territory of caveats, I might correct myself now, because strictly speaking, I didn't buy a house and a boat. And we did. We being my wife and I. But you're not very likely to see a lot of my wife on this channel. Why she loves cameras, being behind them and recording and taking photos and stuff. She absolutely loathes being in front of them and being the center of attention. I'm not much of an attention hawk myself either, but I figured that I wanted to share what I'm doing with Ophelia. Originally, I just wanted to share it with my dad, but that's not exactly relevant anymore. So I wanted to share it with you guys. And well, here we are. And who am I? Well, my name is Thijs and I'm from Denmark. And at the time of recording this, I'm 46 years old. I was born in the southern part of Denmark, not too far from the German border, so besides English and Danish, I also speak German, which comes in surprisingly handy when you're trying to track down the story of an old boat built ages ago in Germany. Up until about a year ago, my family and I were living in Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark, but in November of 21, we moved from Copenhagen to Marstel on Ere, an island in the southern part of Denmark, to the house I mentioned earlier. We didn't exactly plan on buying both a boat and a house, but before we bought the house we currently live in, we were looking at another one, and that was snatched up before we could buy it. So we gave up on the idea of moving because we couldn't find something suitable. And then I started looking at other options, like kind of like a floating summer house. And my younger brother pointed me in that direction of Ophelia, and well, I bought her, and then, as luck would have it, shortly after, this house showed up. Now, considering the size of a project like this, with the many, many things that need to be done with a boat like Ophelia, you're probably thinking that I must have a background in shipbuilding, like shipwright or something. Well, no, not really. I'm trained as a teacher, and I've been working as a substitute teacher in a variety of schools for the last many years, and that's probably how things are going to stay for quite a while. I did, however, sail quite a lot when I was younger, and... I like learning new stuff, so I consider this a massive learning experience with the added bonus of having a boat that I know inside out once I'm done with the restoration, of course. There is a snack with this project though, because while well, this is real life and there always is. As a substitute teacher, I don't exactly make a lot of money. So I try to do things myself and do them as cheaply as possible while still doing them good enough. And this hopefully will work out because there is money for the current projects. I unfortunately got an inheritance at the start of 2022 when my father died. So it's not a fortune, 
and I need to be frugal, but it should be enough for what I'm doing at the moment. Well, enough about me, let's get back to the boat. Like I showed you earlier, this is what Ophelia looked like shortly after we bought her. As you can see, what is left of the paint is peeling and there's quite a bit of surface corrosion. A lot of it is probably due to the unfortunate combination of ordinary steel and stainless steel. And of course, a lack of maintenance doesn't exactly help. The anchor chain is actually new and it has never been used, but while it moves freely, it doesn't exactly look the part any longer. The hatches are old, but they're still serviceable. However, they do have aluminium frames and some of them are mounted on stainless steel, which is then welded to ordinary steel. Not exactly a good thing if you want to avoid corrosion. It's quite impressive that some of the paint still holds up, but it has clearly reached its end. The house is an issue in itself. The sides are stained as steel, welded to the hull, while the tub is made from fiberglass. Ophelia's boat neighbour has been doing quite a bit of maintenance on the cockpit, so the teak in the cockpit still looks really nice. The only real issue seems to be at the lower edge of the seating area where some moss or something similar has found a foothold. When we got Ophelia, her lazarette was full of sailing related crap, one of life jackets and such, but it also held a few good items such as a couple of anchors in different sizes. The winches, both the small and the big ones, look quite rough, but they work and seem serviceable. The side compartments in the cockpit clearly show that we have a few issues with water entering where it's not supposed to go, and we've had so for a while. The removable covers seal just fine, so the water must get in elsewhere. While the teak trim on the house top looks fine, the roof itself is a major source of headaches. As I said earlier, the structure is made from fiberglass and wooden structure and has been set between the stainless steel walls. This was done without creating any overlap with the topside fiberglass, meaning that this roof has a snowman's chance in hell of ever being completely waterproof, no matter the amount of sealant applied. While Ophelia hadn't been sailed in a while, she hadn't been completely disused. In exchange for looking after Ophelia, the boat neighbor in the marina was allowed to use her as a teenager boat. But as I said earlier, the previous owner had started working on the engine, but he hadn't put it completely back together again. So while the engine had a brand spanking new heat exchanger mounted, no hoses for circulating the cooling liquid had been put in place for the thing to actually do its job. Now this is where the problem with the roof becomes self-evident. The water leaking through the roof used to pool on top of the water tank, and with plenty of oxygen from all the slushing back and forth, it caused some serious corrosion issues. It seems, however, that the hull in the tank area may have been saved from the worst of this issue when the lid of the water tank rusted through. From then on, the leaking water went directly into the water tank, which probably had a better chance of resisting the corrosion than the fairly unprotected hull. All through hulls and valves are placed quite inaccessibly in this boat, and they all look fairly corroded. Only the valve for the engine cooling can be opened and closed, the rest are stuck in whatever position they were left in eight years ago. This pile is a standing rigging, but even though it looks messy, it's all accounted for. This toilet supposedly works, but it's just too small. There's no way anyone above the age of five will fit on this throne. Ophelia's former role as teenager boat is easy to see here. Most of this mess was cleaned out before we moved her though. You might have noticed these prisms in the deck earlier and they are an interesting touch. They channel a lot more light below decks than you'd expect. A couple of them are slightly cracked at the edges, but so far none seem to be leaking. The steering wheel was glaringly absent at this point. This is because the pump for the hydraulic steering was defective and had been removed a number of years before we bought Ophelia. We found the old pump in a cockpit locker and a new one had been stored in the locker in the salon. So I guess the obvious question now is, what are my plans for Ophelia? Well, two words really, recovery and modernization. And well, recovery kind of has to come first, right? 
So I'm trying to assess the damage that has already been done to the boat while at the same time stopping it from progressing and getting worse. Now, the hull clearly needs to be first priority. It's in a pretty bad shape and it's indispensable. So she's in need of a sandblasting and a new coat of paint. And the immediate future, therefore, seems to hold quite a lot of tearing down and grinding. Because before we start sandblasting, I'll need to have a good long look at the corrosion damage to the inside of the hull. I'd rather not blast a hole through Felia if I can avoid it. It's clearly better if I blast a hole in her on the heart rather than in the water, but the shipyard would probably be at the happiest if we can stick to the timetable we agree to rather than going, whoops, there's a hole somewhere along the line. Now, regarding modernization, I'm still in the ideas phase where there are plenty of ideas and possibilities and nothing has really been locked down firmly yet, other than the fact that the house and housetop will clearly need a complete reworking. I'm also trying to get a hold of a copy of the original design plans for Ophelia. And in that regard, a huge thanks goes out to Ulrich Körner, the maintainer of the Berlin Archive, for his promise to try and help. Try and help because, well, those papers may no longer exist. Does it matter if they exist? What does it matter what Ophelia was originally supposed to look like? Well, it matters to me because I like Ophelia's lines and I like the design ideas that come with those lines. So I'd like to retain as much of them as possible even though I'm not doing a back to basics rebuild, I still like to retain as much of the original design as possible. Considering though the fire in 69 and the many refits Ophelia has had along the lines, I suspect that there's not much left of the original build other than the hull. Changing things though would definitely be in the spirit of Paul Burling. He was constantly pushing the edge of technology and design and if you look at the three sisters, there are plenty of changes between them, new technologies and just different technologies. For instance, the youngest sister, what I suspect is the youngest sister, the Safari, was apparently the first ship ever to get a complete aluminium rig. Now, those plans would also help me build a digital model of Ophelia, which would be quite helpful in placing the elements of the boat when I change stuff. And if I change things on the outside, that will also help me evaluate the visual expression it gives. If I change the house, for instance, what is this going to look and how's the boat going to change? Now, I could probably keep talking about this for quite a while, but I guess we'll call it here. So that was it for this time. Thank you for tagging along on this outline of what Ophelia used to be and what she is now. And hopefully we'll get around to what she's going to be in the not too distant future. I intend to upload a new video once every week. And in the next episode, I'm going to have a look at what I did to get Ophelia moving again and how her first trip in eight years went, the 163 nautical miles from Copenhagen to Marstall. Please click the subscribe button so you don't miss any uploads and also please click the like button. If you got this far, I probably didn't bore you completely out of your mind. Hope you will tag along again next week and see you then.